If the representative from the Census Bureau is still here, I wanted to give you a minute to talk. Are you still here? Yay. So you guys, the census is so important. Everyone knows that from this conversation that we just had. So um, I was thrilled yesterday when they reached out to us and asked if they could table an event. I was like, we're gonna let you talk, please come. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for allowing us to be here. And I just want to say that uh, we need trusted voices in the community to get help us get the message out that it is important, that it is the law, and that the information is private and confidential. If they hear it from us, you know, but if they hear it from trusted voices, you, you guys, trusted voices in the community, then they take that more to heart. And we also are recruiting. Uh, we are going to be hiring between 25 to 3,000 people uh, next year, the peak of the census. And so we ask people to, to uh, do, uh, apply online. 2020census.gov slash jobs because we need to hire people from their own community. People are going to be hired by, by zip code and we are going to need to hire them and train them by the end of the year. We have an operation right now where we hired a lot of people and that was for address canvassing. We're looking at what we have on the maps and actually go, go on the ground and see is it vacant? Is it a building? Is it a home, an apartment? So that's what we're doing right now. The timeline will start in January, where we're going to have census workers go to group quarters. Anywhere where people live together, universities, um, prisons, nursing homes, RV parks, anywhere where people live together, that's going to be done um, in starting January, as well as the military, and then the homeless will be count uh, in February. And uh, we don't know the date, and we, we won't, because we need, we're gonna have an army of census workers, you know, going to where the home, we know the, the homeless uh, live. Um, March is when you're going to start receiving your letter with the code that you can do your uh, census application online. This is the first time that it's been done that, and we know that there's a digital divide, so we need a lot of people to, are they going to need help? You can do the census by phone, by on computer, or in person, and you can also ask for the application, uh, the questionnaire to be sent to you. So uh, that would be starting in March. You can start filling out the questionnaire March 12th. April 1 is Census Day. That means where are you living on Census Day? That is the question and you put everyone, in, and the questionnaire will say who you need to count. Don't count your children if they're on campus. Count your relatives or anyone that's staying there if you're, uh, have a daughter that has a friend that's homeless uh, living with you, then you count everyone in your household. That will go through April, late of April through July is when our work, census workers will be knocking on doors. But we really want, we get the best um, data from people that self-respond. So that's what, that's a big push. In 2010, we missed over a million children, five and under, nationwide. And so with that people, communities could not plan or did not receive the funds for more teachers, more schools, and the education. So there's a big effort you know, to make sure that uh, children five and under will be counted, as well as the different areas that we know, people that are fearful, people that have a, um, a language barrier or do not have a computer. The library is one of our partners that is go we're going to have people 
help them with the, uh, the computer to fill out the questionnaire. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, any questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. They're in English, and you can request it in multiple languages. And you can also call, and there'll be multiple uh, languages that people will be, can talk, you know, will be able to uh, talk with you uh, to help you out. There is going to be a language, the questionnaire will be in English and Spanish, but you, we can request, you can request other languages. So we don't know what that need will be until, you know, we get called, and, and it's going to be available. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, that's a good question. You will get hired by zip code, so you work in your community. You will not work in a specific community. It would be uh, whoever gets assigned to work the group quarters, the people that get assigned to work with the homeless, but it's not a, a, an assignment per, per population. It's uh, the operation that determines you know, who gets uh, assigned to what areas. But it is, um, we need to hire uh, within uh, the people that live in the community, 18 and older, 14 to $18 an hour. They get paid for training, for mileage, and get paid every week. So we're recruiting parents, grandparents. We hired, we just hired a 78 and 80 year old man uh, and the 78-year-old man's wife is so happy. <laughs> but, you know, it, yeah. so please, please uh, let your family and friends know that, and they need to apply now. They're not gonna get called right away. It takes maybe two, two, two and a half months because of the background check and the process, but we need the people that uh, will get called late November or December training. Yes, that's part of uh, group quarters. Okay, so you could request that. No, so, you can't. You you get assigned. Yeah, any any group quarters <coughs> and will be counted, and so the, uh, even uh, well the the prisons, but in, all the centers. Any questions? Thank you so much for your time. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, besides the traditional divide, would it be easier to sponsor like group settings, like at a church or a community center where we could help the person? I feel like I need to take my talk from the center of the room. <laughs> <laughs> The, they will be working, um, will start working in December if they get uh, hired and they will be trained January through July is the operations. And starting late April, May is when we go back to the homes that do not respond. So that's the, the big push that everyone hears about. But it, we need to uh, finish by July. We have to, everything that we count has to be validated and then the final report goes to the president on December 31st, 2020. So yes, thank you again to the league uh, because we know that a lot of people are going to need help and they need to be comfortable in where they're going to, to get the help. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>
do the last portion of the talk, um, just so you guys you guys know what's coming in front of you. So first of all, I want to say thank you for coming out on a Saturday to listen to this. <laughs> very much appreciate it, and I very much appreciate the uh, San Antonio League for hosting us today. Um, so the League of Women Voters of Texas received a grant. We applied for it back in May, and we got that grant from our National League. And the whole idea behind this was to, you know, have the next year to get the public ready for these public input hearings. Um, but then, of course, the legislator has, because we've been pushing them <laughs> for more hearings and more transparency, um, they decided to start those hearings rapid fire. So they're starting, I guess, in two weeks. Um, and all of our major cities are packed in the first two months, and I'm pretty sure they've done that on purpose, so we don't have as much time to prepare everyone. So uh, I want to make sure that you guys know about that public hearing, like Senator Menendez was talking about, that's September 12th. Um, and we need you guys to come out and participate, and we, we need your help spreading the word about it as well. Um, so uh, I want to talk. The first thing I always have to end, um, start with is if you would like to join the League, please, please check out our website on how to do so. Um, we are always looking for new members to participate and to help set up events like this. Um, so yeah, please consider joining us. So Chris Carson is our, our our national president, and um, I wrote to her, uh, I guess it was a year and a half ago now, but I needed help with a, a talk. Uh, there was this big math group coming into town, and um, it, it's more of like a national level uh, talk that I had to give. It was just a quick five minute pitch. So I wrote to her and I said, hey, can you just help me come up with some talking points just to make sure I'm representing the league appropriately? And Christine, the A-type that she is, she actually gave me kind of the whole speech. <laughs> But when she sent it back, everything kind of firmed up what my job was um, and what we need to do to mobilize the community. Um, so I'm just going to read you her little spiel that she wrote. There is a whole component of citizen education dealing with transparency and public engagement that is absolutely vital to any redistricting system. People need to understand what the current redistricting process is, why it is so bad, and what can be done about it in clear, simple terms. We need good material in all formats and good speakers to share that material. We need volunteers who represent our diversity to help us inform our communities. We need to focus on creating a more transparent process. We need people to watch when the new maps are drawn to guard against gerrymandering. Sunlight disinfects. If the line drawers aren't doing anything funny, then there is no reason to go behind closed doors. The public needs to see and understand who is drawing the maps and how they are drawn. So that right there kind of summarizes everything we need to be doing <laughs> in a nutshell. So redistricting is one of the most important processes in our democracy because it determines the power of your vote. It determines how your community is represented. It determines which communities are going to be located in your district with you. And then it determines who goes on to elect or who, who you go on to elect, elect to represent you. And that elected official then turns around and makes very important decisions about the quality of the air you breathe, the quality of your water, the quality of your child's school, the quality of health care, the quality, <laughs> and how much you pay in taxes. So these, these um, decisions that they're making um, on our behalf affect us in our everyday life. So it's very important that we're involved in the redistricting process as much as possible to make sure that we get good and, and adequate representation to take care of those needs. So why do we need districts anyways? I want you guys to drop yourselves back in time, back to the 1800s, and pretend like you're going out to West Texas to set up a town. What are some of the first things you're going to need to find when you get out there? A water supply, a way to grow food, a way to build a house. Soon enough, you might have a small town showing up, right? You might have a grocery store, a school, a hospital. Maybe the line of transportation comes by next, maybe the railroad. So that, that town that eventually develops is what we, what we refer to as a community of interest. And that community needs to have a cohesive voice of representation um, representing them in government to make sure they get all of their needs taken care of. So I'm going to briefly go through the rules for redistricting. Um, We've already talked about the census, so the redistricting process is going to start at the census. We're going to count everyone up, and then we go through something called reapportionment. Reapportionment is where they go back and allocate congressional seats um, based on your state's population. So some states gain seats, some states lose seats. Um, that was what was discussed a little bit on the panel discussion. So Texas, I think, were estimated to gain three seats. Um, but besides that, there's shocking, shockingly little guidelines basically to determine how our, our districts are drawn after that. 
So we get that census data back from the government and then we have to redistrict everything, right? We have to draw new districts to make sure that they're all of equal size. That's what the one person, one vote, vote ruling was about. Our districts have to be equal sized. So our federal guidelines reflect that. Our, our, our districts have to be equal sized. Um, we also have the, the Voting Rights Act that um, we must uphold, or, or what's left of it, I should say. Um, we cannot dilute the power of minority representation. Racial gerrymandering is basically what we're concerned about in, in the VRA when it comes to redistricting. Um, our state guidelines, uh, we have, again, not many <laughs> guidelines to uh, direct us for how to draw these districts. For state house districts, we have something called the county line rule. That means that if you have a county with a large enough population for two districts, that means that that county has to have those two districts within the whole county, if that makes sense. So you can't cross a county line if population permits. Um, and then our Texas Senate districts, they must be single member and contiguous. So, you know, how is this process of redistricting so bad? Um, you know, we don't have too many guidelines, but where is this going wrong? It's going wrong with something called gerrymandering. Um, gerrymandering is a process of drawing district lines to favor one group of people over another. We have two types of, of gerrymandering. We have partisan gerrymandering and racial gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering is still being allowed by the Supreme Court. That was what that recent Supreme Court case was, um, Rucho out of North Carolina. Um, the Supreme Court in June said that we're gonna let partisan gerrymandering go. It's fine. Uh, it's too much of a political question for us to get involved. Then we have racial gerrymandering. Racial gerrymandering was supposedly outlawed by the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Um, what's the problem with these two being in existence at the same time? Race and partisanship often go hand in hand, like overwhelmingly here in Texas. So the, the black community votes overwhelmingly Democratic. According to latest Pew estimates, 90% of the community votes for a Democrat. And in the Hispanic community, it's 70% of the Hispanic community will vote for a Democrat. So the state will claim that they are using partisan gerrymandering to draw their districts, but at the same time, what they're doing is infringing the, on the rights of minority voters by diluting their vote. So the big question is, does this translate into an advantage? Does gerrymandering and the way the district lines are drawn translate into an advantage for that party? And so I have two examples up. I have the Democrats in the 90s. So um, not many people know this, but the Democrats heavily gerrymandered in the 90s. Um, it was actually considered um, the third worst gerrymander in US history based on some of these mathematical models that are coming out. Um, so when you look, they won 50% of the votes, but they captured 70% of the seats. And this is for the US congressional races then. So I've come up here to current day, and it's Republicans that are gerrymandering against um, Democrats. So uh, in 2018, Republicans won 50% of the vote, but they've captured 63% of the seats. So that's an excess, I think, of three or four seats that they have right now in, in US Congress. Um, one important thing that I forgot to mention is that these maps are passed as regular legislation, right? So they have to be passed through the House and the Senate, and then the governor has to give his stamp of approval for it at the end of the day. Um, the problem with this is that this gives one party a distorted control over the process. And that's why you see the Democrats who were in control in the 90s having that tilt toward the Democratic Party, and today you see Republicans having that advantage. So how are the maps drawn? Legislators consult with data analysts. Yes, they do. <laughs> State party officials and special interest groups, they meet behind closed doors, and they do not have to consider the public's input, unfortunately. Um, at the end of the day, they, they get to say, uh, what the map is gonna look like. Um, and it's gonna be up to us to hold them accountable and to call them out on that. They use partisan and demographic data and go block by block to choose their voters. Um, and this is the congressional district that we were talking about quite a bit. So this is like Doggett's district. Um, it's over there on that poster. Um, the purple on that poster is the Hispanic community. So when they drew that district, what they claimed they were doing is giving the Hispanic community a voice but I wanna point out that in 2017, a federal court, uh, actually here in San Antonio, uh, determined that was a racial gerrymander. Um, and the reason for that was because they, they actually split precincts. 
And uh, we had Lloyd Doggett at our last talk that we gave, and he was ta talking more about it, and they actually split over 100 precincts to draw that district. When you split a precinct, you have to relay, rely on racial data. So that was one of the reasons why the court um, thought that was a racial gerrymander. Um, and what they ultimately decided was that influenced, um, I'm sorry, that decreased the Hispanics community's voice statewide. That, however, was overturned by the Supreme Court. And this is one of the big conundrums that we're in with <laughs> race and partisanship here in Texas. Um, I want to point out just the block by level or block by block detail that they, they gave um, or they uh, implemented um, on that district. So that's San Marcos, and I believe that's Texas State University. But you can see how they, they really have sectioned off just one little chunk of a neighborhood there. Sometimes I just talked about that, so I think I might just skip over that really quick. So let's go into cracking and packing. Um, so this is a great example, first of all, of packing. That's the one that I was just telling you about, where that purple in District 35 is a Hispanic community. Um, let's go over packing, I'm sorry, cracking now. So uh, you heard Senator Mineta's talking about Travis County as being a great example of cracking, and I kind of have a, a, a visual for you so you can see it. So Congressional District 10, um, it's that little red blurb in the 1990s map. That's most of Travis County right there. So for the past 100 years, if not, yeah, I guess more actually, um, a Congressional District 10 was always like this huge liberal pillar surrounded by a sea of red. They've always voted Democratic. Um, and then, um, so you see one whole Congressional District there. In 2003, when Tom DeLay did his mid-census redistricting, they started cracking up Travis County to dilute their vote. And over here in 2017, there really isn't too much of Congressional District 10 in, uh, left in Austin right now. Um, there is just a tiny bit, but what they've done basically is they've split Travis County into five congressional districts, and they've diluted the Democratic voice with the more rural areas that vote more conservative. So out of um, those five congressional seats that we have, only one is a Democrat, and that was the racial gerrymander I want to point out with Lloyd Doggett's district. Um, and so they've really kind of neutered Travis County's representation and voting power. Did you have a question? That's for the state house rules. So our state senate and our US congressional, there is no geographical restriction like that. And that is part of the problem. And that was one of the strategies that we tried to push forward to get legislation through this past session. Yes, ma'am. So that's a good question, and um, I think that the Supreme Court really failed the America and our democracy here when they made this most recent decision to stay out of partisan gerrymandering. So that case was to basically determine if you could set a limit on how much partisan gerrymandering was too much. What's the bounds? And their, their answer was, there is no bounds. We're going to stay out of this. And they said that uh, certain states can go ahead and implement citizen, nonpartisan redistricting commissions if they choose to do so. But I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. We can't do that easily here in Texas. And so I just want to point out that the Supreme Court has, in my opinion, failed us and our democracy tremendously over the past 10 years. We had Citizens United. We had the Perez trial, which upheld this racial gerrymander. Uh, we had the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, and so they are really kind of unraveling our democratic institutions and our safeguards um, tremendously over the past 10 years. And this latest instance of um, this partisan gerrymandering case just adds to that pile. So when you look at the legislature as a whole, and this is what I really want to point out, um, this, this is kind of demonstrates how race and partisanship go hand in hand. Um, so 58% of Texans are, consist of people of color. So you would expect to see that reflected at the legislature as well if we had fair districts for those communities of color. And unfortunately, right now, we only have 36% people of color representing us at the state legislature. So you see that skew as well. 
So this is the most important slide, I think, out of all of them, um, of the effects of gerrymandering, because um, a lot of this isn't very um, obvious until you start thinking about it. So legislators are drawing safe districts for themselves. What happens when they do that? The, that means that the election gets moved to the primary, right? Because you know which party is gonna win that district. So when you move that election, the race to the primary, what's gonna happen? You have no compromise um, going on across party line, right? In fact, it's, it's the opposite. You kind of have to pander to the extremes now to win the primary. Um, so when, you, when that happens, you see more party pull, or I'm, yeah, more extreme polarization occurring between the parties. Importantly, you cannot hold legislators accountable to the power of your vote, right? If you wanna vote them out of office, you can't do it in the general election. You have to go to the primary. Um, this also leads to incumbents getting reelected, and a lot of these incumbents are very entrenched, both Democrats and Republicans alike right now. It's a little sickening. <laughs> so um, at any rate, the incumbent will get reelected. It's hard to find a challenger. Races go uncontested. Um, and why do you wanna show up to vote when you know who's gonna win the election? And that has an effect on down ballot races as well. Yes, ma'am. There's a few reasons why you still want to come out and testify. There's a few reasons why you want to come out and testify. Number one, there's going to most likely every 10 years, there's always redistricting litigation that occurs and it's always based on racial gerrymandering claims. We need people from the community to come out and provide that testimony on where their communities of interest are so we can use that in future litigation. Number two, there's an even more important reason. They're gonna be redrawing all of these districts. They're not gonna stay the same. They're gonna redraw them based on growth. We're gonna get more congressional districts. They're gonna to have to give, I believe, Bear County another district. So we need to come out and tell them where our, com our communities are so they can try to protect them and keep them whole as much as possible in the future maps. So I'm not gonna go over the Supreme Court case. We've talked about that enough. Um, this is a legislation that Senator Menendez filed. Um, the league was very happy that he actually filed that. We didn't know he was filing it on the Senate side. We worked very hard to get it filed on the House side. So we ran them as companion bills. Um, so many states are actually moving to nonpartisan commissions. Um, the one thing that all of those states have going for them is they have access to a ballot and initiative process. So they can have a ballot measure to get it on the ballot for people to vote on. We don't have that here in Texas, so in order to get this legislation through, we'll have to have a, a constitutional amendment for our state legislative districts, but for our U.S. congressional districts, it's quite easy. We just need a state statute. So these commissions, um, are, they, they're always um, free of legislative influence, and to give you an idea of the, the, like the six or seven step process that they use to guarantee that, um, usually that, that conflicts of interest list means you couldn't have been a legislator, you couldn't have worked for a legislator, you couldn't have lobbied for a legislator, you could have donated, couldn't have donated more than $2,500 to that campaign, you couldn't have um, worked for a state party um, at any level, I believe, and then also you, you, your family member, it, it's the same, you, you could not, any of your family, that applies to them as well. So in California, they started with an applicant pool of 30,000 people for this commission. By the time they applied that strict conflicts of interest list, they whittled it down to 2,000. So just think about that and how effective it was. So Senator Menendez's uh, legislation was very similar. Um, so those commissioners that were chosen, you had five Democrats, five Republicans, four independents. Importantly though, all of that is great and dandy, but the way they drew the districts is super important. They did not use partisan data. So right now they're using partisan data, right? They know who's a Democrat, who's a Republican, and they draw the districts based on that to give one party an advantage. In California, they were blind. They didn't know who was a Democrat, who was a Republican. Not only that, but they had a very strict complex, or I'm sorry, a strict list of ranked criteria that they used to draw the districts, and we'll talk about that in a second. So here in Texas, oh, and the last thing that they did 
was not only did that commission draw the districts, but more importantly, they had 33 public hearings around the state. People showed up to tell the commissioners where their communities of interest were. And you, that is super critical. And so the commissioners then drew the maps there at the meetings, the public input hearings basically, or at a public work session. But it was all 100% based on the, the public's input. And so we have a similar, slightly similar process here in Texas where they have those public input hearings that are coming up that I keep plugging. Um, so uh, yes, I know that they might not have to listen to us, but I just explained the reasoning be um, behind why we need to show up. We need to tell them what, where our communities of interest are because they're gonna be changing these lines. Um, the, we're getting three new congressional seats or state house seats are in flux as well. Um, and our big metroplex areas are gonna be getting more districts, more, most likely in the state house. So we need to be able to, to show up to tell them where our communities of interest are. Not only that, I want everyone to turn around and take that to your state legislators. In 2011, it was the state house reps that drew their own districts, basically. So I would like to be able to take it to them and, and push and advocate them to adopt a fair and transparent process and to protect their communities. So a community of interest, as I've been saying, is a contiguous population which shares common social and economic interests that should be included within a single district for purposes of its effective and fair representation. So you want to be able to effectively advocate for your shared needs in your community. These are that, those ranked criteria that I was talking about. So number one is equal population, one person, one vote. Comply with the Voting Rights Act. Um, and this really applies to if you wanna go and get into the nitty gritty of drawing your own district map to take with you, which I really encourage everyone to try to do at least, or to at least take a map, even Google Maps, and try to map out where your community is, where's your house, where's your school, where's your work, where's your grocery stores, and to help kind of narrow down that community in your area. Um, so I've mentioned the state house uh, rule that we have for the county line rule where if a district, a district should be kept within a county if population permits. Um, and then this is the one that the league, again, I, I keep plugging, uh, we wanna protect our communities of interest. This is the one that the league is a very big supporter of. Um, we wanna be able to keep our, our neighborhoods whole. Um, we wanna be able to advocate for shared needs as a, as a neighborhood, right? So who in here lives in one of these funky districts where your neighbor across the street from you lives in a diff different district or even like two blocks down from you? Is that anyone in here? No? Usually, you'd be surprised, I do a lot of these talks, at every meeting I've been to so far, at least two or three people have raised their hands and that's really how bad it's gotten. Um, and these are people that have the same shared resources as you. So there's a, a reason why you wanna keep this all together or keep everyone together. Compactness is also one to consider, not really a super critical. Yes, ma'am? I'm gonna tell you at the end. <laughs> and then um, nesting, don't worry about nesting. Nesting is just if you want to have all of your districts overlap. So um, if you want your congressional district um, to encompass your state house district and your state senate district and your city council, just for the purposes of overlapping representation, that's what nesting is. Um, and all of this, this part about nonpartisan criteria is in the packet. I, I pretty much copied all of the slides um, and gave it to you. Um, so you can actually have access to it and take it home with you. So here are some examples of communities of interest, some, a place that has a shared culture or history, common transportation, um, weather, water, watershed, um, that's like water boards and stuff like that, economical regions, so industrial, ag agricultural, tech, army, recreational areas, income status, housing, languages spoken, schools, healthcare areas, and hospital districts, and then a common goal, is there some sort of policy issue that your community has been advocating for for a long time, like reducing crime or increasing jobs. So these are the two websites that I wanted to point out. I don't know if, I, I don't think I connected to the internet, so I can't connect you. The first one though is District Year. This is provided by the state legislator. So if you want to pull up what the current districts look like, that's the website that you would go to. And again, I think that's already included in the handout that I gave to you as well, so you don't have to worry about writing it down. Um, the next one is 
this math group that I mentioned earlier, they created their own districting software. And what's great about it is that when you sit down to build districts, you build it based off of election precincts. So there, you can't really get into too much funny business when you put together your community of interest. This one is free though. The software is usually very expensive to like a professional one. Um, it, it costs upwards of $10,000 sometimes for these licenses. And I wanna point that out because you know we want to enable our communities to participate in this process and be, have access to these tools and the league was uh, advocating for such legislation that would have made the state do that, um, and they didn't. <laughs> Anyways, this one is free. It's not great, but it's there, and I encourage everyone to go and use it. Yes? When you say you use a method tube, is that, is that where all the demographics are in there? You're just drawing it, and it'll just redraw everything? Or yeah. do you have to actually go in and, and manipulate everything manually? Okay, ask again. So for, there's District R, so District R does oh. have demographic data. Okay, so like my understanding from you know like 15 years ago was that when the state legislative council, whatever, came up with that Red Apple software that they used to do all that gerrymandering, they had they had software already written so that you know, they could just drag, they could just click and drag a line, then it would just recalculate all the all of the population, yep. you know, in there automatically. Is that what the Mapitude thing will do, or is that just that's both District R District R and Maptitude. Maptitude is the professional version. The league has bought a copy. If you would like to access it, you'll have to email me and I can give you access. You'll have to ins install Amazon Workspaces and then basically like check it out, like a library book. You get so much time to use it or whatever. I want it on this day. Um, and, and you know, are you saying that, that some of the other stuff up there, is, I mean, because I, I do GIS. I mean, I, I've done it for 30 years, but I mean, I, but I've never done No, 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 go ahead, keep going. Well, I'm just saying that if there's some software out there that runs, if it runs only on Mapitude, right, the software that somebody's written runs only on Mapitude, but District R, is that something, or that's another one that does redistricting that you can yes. run with the boundary? Yes, yes, and you piece together districts based off of precinct level data. So you okay. highlight the precinct, and then you go and highlight another one, and it'll update and give you a percentages of what the ethnicity is, the total population, uh, voting age population, the whole nine yards, but that's based off of, keep in mind, that's based off the 2010 census data. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joaquin because he's gonna go over some of the stuff that we're asking the House Committee to consider and adopt when they start drawing these districts. Can I ask one more question, please? Uh, uh, is there, uh, you know, what is it, uh, so, so is voting, if you're a Democrat and you vote in a Republican primary, you have open primaries, does that confuse the redistricting process in any way? It can, yes, and, right. And so, I mean, are there guerrilla tactics? Because we know what's gonna happen. I mean, they're gonna get the smoke filled room and they're gonna redraw the with, they're gonna gerrymander the crap out of Texas again. It's like they've done for the last 50 years. So if, if we're making that assumption, can we just also assume that maybe there's some other process where we can confuse and confound them in their in their process and just do some guerrilla tactics like voting in, Trying to get the, what is the information that they're using to gerrymander? I mean, if they can only use our pre primary vote to gerrymander, is that what their primary, is that the They use both doing? your primary data, but then they also look to see how many, like how many times you voted in the past five years, because they want to see what the likelihood of that person voting Democrat or Republican is, because that uh, shores up their predictions, right? Yeah. You mean, it, you mean it's just the raw number of times you vote over the last five they have election data, yeah. So they don't know how you voted in the election, but they know that you did vote. So are you a three-time Democratic voter? Are you a three-time Republican voter? Um, if that three-time being you voted in the primary three times, they know, they have access to that. And that's how they shore up their predictions of, you know, who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. So I want to emphasize, please come to these hearings and give them hell. I'm serious. <laughs> you had your hand up, yeah? Yes. Now, my understanding in the past that an ordinary citizen can get engaged by actually using the computer that's available to the public in the past that the legislators used to draw the districts and you can do it in real time, sit down at the computer screen. So
So they don't have. Draw your own map and check it for population equality and meeting the Voting Act requirements. So the ordinary citizen, at least in the past, had the ability to draw a proposed map and present it to the legislature. They're not going to do that. Um, they don't have Red Apple stations available anymore. If you want to access Red Apple, you'll have to talk with your state rep or state senator to give you access to it. So in effect, they cut the public off yes. in that aspect of the... So that's why I gave you some tools. So that District R is one of those pieces of software that will, it's not going to be as fancy as Red Apple, the state's uh, software, but it's something to go off of. It's a good starting point. Really what you're going for is these communities of interest. Yes. But then also the second level to that is you want to be able to show an alternative plan. They're going to give us crappy districts, right? I guarantee you they're going to give us really horrible districts. The question is, if it does violate the VRA, you need to be able to show an alternative plan that it, here's a better district that would have given my community exactly. a good voice. And you need that in, in litigation. And, and Yeah, so district, district R does for sure. The Maptitude does. Maptitude is usually what the consultants use, but that's the one that I'm telling you that you'd have to check out a license for it. Um, so you just come up to me afterwards and I can okay, get you my great. email address. So I didn't go over my statistics from the 2016 election, <laughs> uh, which I talk about. So the 2016 election was considered, in my opinion, the worst year for turnout and gerrymandering in the whole nine yards. And when you look at the statistics from that election, 90, 98% of incumbents got reelected because of partisan gerrymandering. And I know this past, this past election cycle we had a switch, right? We got some new Democrats elected, but there weren't very many, right? So a good majority of these people are going to come back. Okay, we're good. Uh, so, as we were mentioning, and as y'all pointed out right now, you know, the uh, legislature, there's going to be elections between now and when the legislature actually draws the districts. And as was mentioned previously, the only data we have is from 2010 or estimates after that. So even if you do go right now, say, to district or it's drawing 36 congressional districts with 2010 data. So what I've really tried to do is, uh, you know, in the past, the court, like this last time, the court really hammered the legislature on its closed door process and uh, pointed out the lack of public hearings after an actual map has been proposed and the lack of inclusion of minority groups and members in the process. And so what we're trying to do is uh, incorporate into the testimony, you can go testify about your community of interest, but also incorporate onto the record that it's not enough that they just hold these public field hearings before there's any maps out there, that we want them to take steps to remedy this broken process that they've instituted in the past. And that's important both because it's, uh, setting out goals for the next legislature and also putting it on the record if there is litigation that people made these demands and the legislature still didn't listen or if there's change in leadership or we can just effectively advocate with the current leaders actually getting these implemented and so i put together it's a new packet a uh, list of recommendations that you all can incorporate into your testimony that are geared at improving the process in 2021 where there's actual data. 
And the first one is pretty basic, but something that they haven't done in the past, which is hold a public hearing on their maps after they draw the maps. So the leader of the committee typically will be the one who draws up the map proposal and introduces it. But because session is already underway in the past, they've just uh, gone through committee without actually having a public hearing on their proposed maps. So for instance, if they draw the map and don't release it and just pass it through, there's no chance for anybody to analyze it, to go in and say, you didn't listen to us. You are splitting up our communities of interest. You're drawing these districts to disenfranchise minority groups. And there's no, uh, no way to get that into the record or to make a stir about it at the legislature. So the first recommendation is to hold a public hearing with public testimony on proposed maps after they've been, been drawn and to provide adequate notice to the public about the hearing. And one thing we're hoping to do also is over the course of the next year is build more tools so that we can quickly get the data from their program, the Red Apple program, and put it online for people to view themselves so that there will be notice and some opportunity and chance for the public to look at the maps and say if they're angry about any aspects of it and then show up at the legislature and make that known. And then the next recommendation is to, at these hearings, uh, provide the public with enough time and enough resources if they do want to go in there and look at their own district and say why they think it's messed up to go in and show how it could have been drawn better because for any there to be any problems with the map, you have to show that there was some solution that would have been more fair or wouldn't have discriminated based on race. So we want them to give folks enough time to do so. Then the uh, next recommendation is, so as part of any bill, they attach an analysis of that bill and oftentimes these are very simple and cursory and it just sort of restates what the bill does. So we're asking them for the map bill, which is what will ultimately be what becomes the maps, that they have a beefed up analysis and actually explain the process that they use to create the maps. And if there's anything, for instance, the precinct splits or they split up counties, that uh, anything that deviates from these traditional redistricting principles that are generally held to be good practice, that they explain why they did that in the bill analysis, and that they also include in the bill analysis a, an analysis of the effects of their proposed maps on the ability of uh, historically disenfranchised groups to elect candidates. And this is important because Ultimately, the whole legislator, legislature is voting on these maps, but typically in the past it has been this backroom process where it's just the leaders. But you have to be able to show that the whole legislature understood if there's going to be a discriminatory effect, that they were aware of that when they voted on it, uh, you know, if you're going to challenge it in court, and just for the general purpose of advocating against that for the remainder of the legislative session. Then the next recommendation is to not look at the partisan data in the first place so they can't hide behind it and say we were just doing this for partisan purposes when their real intent, uh, you know, as Mr. Garza was saying back when it was Democrats in power, they were still uh, discriminating against minorities and now the partisan aspect has sort of changed so they can try to uh, try and do try to hide behind that as an excuse. And we don't want them distorting things for partisan or racial purposes, so it's simplified if they don't look at the partisan data in the first place. And the last aspect, uh, I touched on this earlier, but is to waive their legislative privilege on any communications dealing with map drawing and the proposed bill that becomes the map so that media can have access to this, public can have access to this, and given the history of discrimination, you know, it seems pretty reasonable that we would not want them to hide their communications on this important issue. And so uh, attached to this also, there's a couple of uh, testimony drafts that I just put together, uh, you know, general ideas on how you might be able to tie something, your personal story into it, 
and then sort of incorporate these recommendations. Yes. Yes, and I mean, there is that technology out there. Um, I could find some links uh, for the current maps, but again, that's why we want them to have this uh, public hearing on the actual maps because we are able, once the data comes out, organizations are able to quickly draw maps that do comply with the Voting Rights Act and are fair, and we want to be able to compare those maps in a public setting. Well, and this is another thing, you know, like, it, for instance, in this first sample testimony, it's not, you can t testify about the overall impact that the gerrymandering has on the makeup of the legislature as the whole, or, and, you know, because it's not just, you might be happy with your representatives, but they've split up, you know, to make that District 35, they've split up Travis County into six districts. So it skews the overall makeup of the legislature. And you don't necessarily have to get into a detail about how you would have preferred that particular district to be drawn. You can you know, talk about your community and talk about generally how the process has been unfair and deficient in the past and how you want to see it change this next time. For this field here, they haven't put a limit. Um, I think they might put a limit. Uh, I mean, hopefully there'll be robust attendance at these and, uh, you know, it'll be a packed room. They might put a three minute to five minute limit, something like that, if it's uh, a lot of people there. Yeah. All you can look at is the current maps. They can't draw the new maps yet, so there's nothing to look at yet for the Yeah, basically. And yeah, and if you want to talk about your own particular community that you want kept together in the next cycle. Yeah. Or actually, I think you had your hand up there. Where is this uh, public hearing? Um, it is, do you have the Port handouts? Yeah, Port San Antonio, it's on the southwest side of town. Um, this, is, this is in the program. Do you have the program from here? Oh. Yeah. Uh, there's a sign that you can see. It's, uh, it's uh, located there, but used to be Kelly. Yeah, the old Kelly Air Force Base. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and um, that's why, th so like this first t testimony draft, I tried to uh, sort of do that, and the second one, you know, is another example of if you can talk about your personal experience and general problems with the process, and then I think the league has their own 
draft, and I put one in here, if you did have a specific issue on your community. So the House Redistricting Committee, which is, uh, I believe it's a 15-member body. Um, but they won't all probably, yeah, probably not, <laughs> I would think. Yes. Yeah. In ways that might help the citizens of Stevenson to speak to it and say, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that's why I was asking whether or not they would be involved in that. Yeah, I, I'm, we've been talking to some of them, and I hope, I'm hopeful that they will be because I think that would be. Yeah, for sure. Even you can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and your city council person. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. All right. No, no, one, one more. I guess. How do we find out who these people are? Um. Let me make sure I have it up on my website. So, and if you go to Texas Legislators website, you can go and find the committees on. I believe there's a link on the left hand side. Um, and you can look up who's the county redistricting committee. The name The, the Texas House Redistricting Committee. If you Google that, it should link you straight to it. And Ina Minjadas and Lyle Larson are the two San Antonio area representatives. So one thing that you could um, say when you go to this hearing, um, the chairman of the, the committee is Phil King. Uh, he's also the former chairman of ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. I'm glad you guys know who they are. So at their recent uh, conference they had two weeks ago in Austin, one of their presenters was telling, advising them to destroy your emails at the end of the day if you don't want it to come up in discovery in future litigation. So you can go there and say, I want you to have an honest process. I don't want you destroying your emails. Um, you can just call them out on that for stuff that you know that they're going to be doing behind our backs. That really destroys our democratic system of government. If, if they're doing that on the redistricting committee, who's to say they're not doing it on other committees as well? We need to hold them to a higher standard. And so in a, a, a few weeks, we're going to be launching our own counter campaign, an open and honest <laughs> redistricting campaign, because that's what we need to be shooting for, not telling people to destroy emails. Oh, is that a sure, but we can help you find out and yeah. we can try to post notice of that. And there's also going to be translate, translators available. You just have to give them public notice um, three days in advance, but I can help you find it on the committee's website or their page at least. And definitely if, if you have, you know, feel free to um, email me or Stephanie. My email is uh, Joaquin at Texas Civil Rights Project. But if you know that you have like a presentation that's a bit longer, we can also try to talk to a member of the committee, and they can always just ask you a question or ask you to, you know, finish a presentation or something like that. Yeah. Well, we're the. Fair, I want to give credit uh, to the Fair Maps Texas Coalition. So. Um, I got together with Common Cause, who Al Kaufman's wife is on their board. Um, at any rate, Common Cause and the League of Women Voters got together, I guess it was two and a half years ago now, and um, put together this Fair Maps Texas Coalition. But we also have the Texas Civil Rights Project, the ACLU, Clean Elections Texas, Common Ground for Texas, Texas Progressive Action Network, but we are a collective hive mind <laughs> trying to improve this process together. So thanks. Thanks. 
So I think we have to go, sorry. <laughs> I think the room is, um, we only have it until 12.30, so I think we need to close up. If you have any other questions, though, you can feel free to come up and ask. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, uh, for putting this together. If you have any questions, feel free to even send an email to the League of Women Voters of San Antonio, and I'll forward the email to the appropriate person to get your answers. And thank you all for coming.